Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Caravan of Garbage, where we're wrapping up Mel Gibson's Mad Max trilogy. He had his time. You mean in, like, in judgment? No, in Mad Max. Ma- no, no. <laughs> He's in constant judgment of the Lord. He knows that better than anybody else. Yeah, right. He's making his new Jesus film, Jesus Goes to Hell and Fights oh. Satan or whatever. That sounds awesome. I don't know what it's called or what he's up to. It's a two-parter. It's a big thing. Jim Caviezel is back. It's a whole situation. Great. <laughs> great. Terrific. Anyway, that's great. Leave a like on this video because we're, of course, talking about Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. The weakest one. It is. Some say it's the best one, though. Who says that? I just It said it on Wikipedia. It's better than I remember it, but yeah. I, I don't enjoy it as much as the other two. This is the one that I suspect when we were kids played most on TV. Yes. Because it's the... It's the, the Peter Pan one. It's the one. kid one. It's the family-friendly one. I mean, not super family-friendly. No. Bullshit. Pink shit. But it's the... The cleanest and neatest and tidiest and... Despite the lawless and grubby world. Absolutely. Yeah, it's all of those things. Uh, This one also, Boys at the 80s. I mean, the last one was made (laughs) in the 80s. That's right. But this one's very serious about being the 80s, In this post-apocalyptic 80s future, the only thing that is not in short supply is hairspray. Oh, my goodness. Uh, How do you feel about Tina Turner's appearance and hairstyle? Because I love all of it. Oh, and song. Yeah, I mean, I, I love it. You know, I, yeah. but I, as I understand it, the way this character, Auntie Entity, who's a character, mm. sort of a, you know, one of the lords of the new apocalypse, mm. as I understand it, um, and she's passed away quite recently, yeah. is that when they were making this movie, they wanted a character who, like everybody, had kind of lost it all in the apocalypse, but then sort of built herself up from nothing which is sort of what happened to Tina Turner in real life. You know, she started yeah. out her, her music career with Ike Turner mm-hmm. and they had a, like a very tempestuous relationship. And when she got out of that, she was left with nothing and mm-hmm. she was just like, I'm going to start again. And then she sort of became a bigger star than she had ever been. Exactly. And as I understand it, they went into this movie like, we should have a kind of character who is like Tina Turner. Mm. And eventually they went... Should we ask Tina Turner? And, and they did. didn't. And then she was, they didn't. She just showed up. I'm in Australia now. I'm going to be in your movie. Yeah, it's incredible because she's not an actor. Mm. Well, she wasn't before this, but just fits right into this universe. Uh-huh. I mean, there's a few singer-songwriter performers in this. We've That's got Australia's true. own Angry Anderson. Now, you know I've had an encounter with Angry I was going to ask you about that. One time I was in uh, the Melbourne CBD with a friend of mine and we were waiting at a traffic light, a pedestrian crossing, and the light turned green, but we were having a nice chat, so we... We didn't go immediately. And then from behind us, we heard a guy go, oh, come on. And we turned around and it was musician, actor, Angry Anderson. Not with, in a car? We thought, no, just, just walking behind us with his boys who were all like a, a foot taller than him, <laughs> all dressed in black. And then we crossed the road very quickly and we're like, he was angry at us. He did his signature move at us. This is the best day of our lives. So this also, it wasn't, it didn't start as a Mad Max film. It was a post-apocalyptic Lord of the Flies film. Oh. And then George Miller like heard the idea and it was suggested that like, hey, you know what? This would make a great Mad Max redemption arc, finding his humanity again, finding his purpose. It's also set 15 years after the last. Okay. So it's quite a big time jump. And it nearly like most Mad Max movies, didn't happen. Of course. Uh, So producer Byron Kennedy, who was instrumental in getting the first one and second one off the ground, as instrumental as George Miller, Mm. I would say, he died while piloting a helicopter in 1983. So George Miller was like, this is kind of a thing that we did together. Now that's tragic, of course, but it is also a classic 80s rich guy thing. (laughs) Oh my God, is it ever? Just pilot a helicopter (laughs) over some big rocks or whatever. (laughs) And it's very Mad Max as well, isn't it? Across the Sydney Harbour. He probably flew that thing over the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Probably tried to do a loop-de-loop. That's probably what did him in, in the end. Yeah, I can't overstate how much of an impact he had on this franchise, like Mm. getting it going, like how integral he was. And George Miller being kind of so devastated by this wasn't going to do it and then decided to co-direct it uh, with George... Ogilvy? Ogilvy, that's right. So what people thought for a long time was that George Miller just did the action Uh and Ogilvy did everything else, which is not true. They just kind of split it up. Okay. However, Mm. but I think yeah, it definitely has a different feel than the other ones. Though in saying that this feels different, they all feel very different from each other. They're all unique, kind of in their own kind of mythological story. They sort of tie into each other, but they don't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Different haircuts. Different haircuts. You should have gone to those feral lost kids 
way earlier than this because I, I think they gave him a great haircut. It? It's probably his best hair. I think it is. It's got a little grey at the temples. Yeah, it's yeah, looking good. He had a bit of that in the last one, but it's it's really coming into it. He also doesn't have his leg brace mm-hmm. from the last movie, but he is still injured. You can see in some shots one of his eyes is dilated and that's the one that gets knocked in the previous oh. one. So, yeah, I think that's fun. Also, is this the first example of a movie, and it probably isn't, where a guy's made to give up all his weapons and he's got so many weapons? That's a great question. I also feel like the amount of weapons he's pulling out isn't representative of the amount of weapons on the table. I feel like he's doubling up on some of them. Because <laughs> okay, there's right. like five or six. Okay, But sure. I feel like the scene goes longer than that. You think maybe he's been like, oh, wait, that's a hairdryer. I'll put that back. <laughs> Deck of playing cards, chewing gum. Yep. Or is this dynamite? No, that's dynamite. You can have that, actually. (laughs) And what do you think of Thunderdome? And going into this, would you assume that this is what Thunderdome is? Well, so, okay, what what I would say overall is... I've written Dirt de Soleil. That's good. (laughs) Thank you. I think the action overall is, is, is less... Uh, spectacular than the previous one. Feels less dangerous. I, well, I mean, I'm perhaps I, I, probably because it is. <laughs> well, yeah, it is. But I'm wondering. I mean, I, I think it may be a part of you know this one is probably almost certainly like directly influenced by like the Hollywood system and what they think you know family audiences wanted yeah. or like a broader audience. Like you know how like when John Woo came to America, he did some you know he did Face Off and he did you mm. know some some big actors. paycheck. Yeah, well, there you go. It's sort of no. He know, did it for a paycheck. He did it for a paycheck. That's he did it for the movie paycheck. It's true. Uh, you know how he's, he's sort of flattened out. Like yeah. You know, it sort of became leaning into the cliches and it made it sort of less interesting. I'm wondering if that's maybe one of the reasons this was sort of made to look less dangerous and less gory to, to mm. you know, appease those bloody Hollywood number crunches. Or, I mean, maybe it's because after the death of uh, Byron Kennedy, he was like, I don't want to put people in dangerous situations yeah. with... I don't want to see really horrific accidents. Exactly. Like the one that happened yeah. to my friend. So yeah. I completely understand that. But that being said, uh, Thunderdome is dumb. <laughs> As a kid, I remember it being way bigger. But yeah. it's just... It's it's like it's just two guys in a in a little cage with with bungee cords. I remember it being outside even. Well, it sort of is outside. Wow. I mean, but it's this incredible spectator sport in this universe. And I don't know if it would be because I feel like half the time it would end in one second. Like he'd just yeah. run up to a guy and stab him with a fork or whatever, and he'd die. And the other half would go for like an hour and a half. <laughs> just two idiots galumphing <laughs> about to work on it out. bungee cords. <laughs> it doesn't look cool. Although Roger Ebert really liked it. I've got to hang on. I'll find this quote. It's not. I don't think it's terrible, but I think for a Mad Max universe, uh-huh. I don't think it's got the kind of the gore or the danger to it. Uh-huh. Even uh-huh. though it is like a, it's covered in spikes and everyone's got a sword and whatever, yep. or a chainsaw. I don't. It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, feel yeah. that. Roger compelling. Ebert called it the first really original movie idea about how to stage a fight since we got the first karate movies. And one of the great creative action scenes in the movies. Well, maybe that's true. This probably hadn't been seen before. It was the parkour of its day. That's right. Maybe for 10 years after, this appeared in movies that we haven't seen. Absolutely. The next James Bond movie, he's just bungeeing around. <laughs> I mean, he bungeed in Goldeneye, didn't he? There we go. Maybe that's why. And we're talking he about it. He bungeed into a toilet, <laughs> as we all know. So, yeah, oh, yeah, by the way, the story in this one is Mad Max, he showed up again. He's carless. Apparently his car is in the back of that uh, that camel thing. We, we can talk about that a bit later yep. and potential sequels and ideas that, that came after this that didn't happen. So, yeah, he's, he's mostly like he's a feral animal and he's just kind of wandering around trying trying to survive and he gets drawn into this world uh, by Tina Turner who says, listen, I want you to throw off the other uh, influencing force at Barter Town who's like a little guy and a big guy and you can kill him in a big arena or whatever uh-huh. and then we'll pay you whatever you want. And he's like, cool, I'll do that. I'll, I'll do anything for money. There's no way anyone would... Be- would betray me in this universe. No, no, it's all fine. Even though they try to betray him immediately. <laughs> then they're like, it's a test. And he's like, oh, all right. All right. <laughs> I feel like the, the myth of him is really rammed up in this one because they're like, look how fast this guy is. And I'm like, he's fast-ish, I guess. <laughs> he's not like crazy fast. Yeah. <laughs> but everybody's very slow. I guess, from mm-hmm. all the irradiated water they've been drinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, so their idea of like entertainment is, is bungee jumping, Thunderdome. Mm-hmm. And then their idea of a gulag is you put a person on a horse backwards and then you put like a big fake head on them and then you just send them out into the desert. Uh-huh. Also, you probably need that horse. This is probably an expensive endeavour. Yeah, you know, you could also, do, hit as, him in the back of the head with a spade. Yeah, and also like, if you've got a big spinning wheel, there's some great options on there. Uh-huh. Like sending someone out in the desert to die, that's not exactly like a thrill a minute. Everyone goes, yay! <laughs> well, he's gone. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's not really anything. No, the horse does die. That's true. So they're not even getting that back. It's not even coming back That's later, I saying. assume. That's what I'm in, saying. In, in fact, it, it was killed in 
the manner of all our childhood fears, which is quicksand. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Encountered very little quicksand in my adult life, if, if I'm honest. And you know what? This is an enduring legacy for horses drowning, if you've seen The Never Ending Story. So, you know, mm -hmm. I love it. It's a staple of my childhood. Watching, staple of your childhood? Thank you. Just watching a horse drown. Uh, also, the pilot's back in this, but it's a different pilot. This mm. is Jebediah. Mm. Uh, George Miller has stated definitively that he's a different pilot. Are they brothers? Has George Miller definitively said whether or not they're brothers? He hasn't said that, no. Interesting. I mean, my question to this is just, why? Like, he could just be the same guy. Yeah. But I guess somebody telling the story is like, this is the archetype of a pilot. This is what yeah. they look like. That's right, Bruce This Spence. guy. Yeah. Maybe there's a bunch of these dudes running around. Maybe they're coming out of a cloning facility. Maybe there's a cloning facility. <laughs> I don't know. We have to check the comics <laughs> or the video game if there's a Bruce Spence cloning facility. We should actually do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it definitely takes a turn into like Ewok Village. Mm -hmm, yeah. And I like the idea for this that they got like a whole bunch of different kids of different ages. There's actors and gymnastics peoples. Gymnasts. Gym, no, uh, musicians. They auditioned like 1,800 kids to find this particular group. And if you watch the behind the scenes stuff, it's it's fun. They're all like having a good time and writing little songs and all of that. Uh, are any of them, have any of them become, gone on to become famous people? Are yes. any of them Silverchair, for example? One of them is Silverchair. One of them is Justine Clark. Oh! Who's great from Play School and various other things. There you go. But uh, started off in Mad Max. So are any of them Grinspoon, the band Grinspoon? I don't think any of them are the band Grinspoon, Mason. I don't think any of them are in the band The Living End either. Not even that guy who's playing the big standy up the electric bass. Area 7? Australian ska band Area 7. One of them might be from Area 7. 28 days. Mm, interesting. Any of them? No, I don't believe so. Okay. I don't want to rule it out. Okay, sure. Are any of them from the band Body Jar, do you think? <laughs> Some of them might be Body Jar. This is what people like, I think, just naming things they don't know. That's right. Get yeah. on Spotify, folks. They're all there. Check it all out. You like late 90s Australian <laughs> pop punk? You won't. <laughs> There's some good stuff in there. I agree. There I is. won't hear a word against it. Here's a song about drinking too much and then trying to drive a car. Is the um is the is the train stunt? Does it live up to the the truck? No. Of the pre. I, I, I'll, I I'll stop you there. I no. I see where they're going. Yeah. Uh -huh, like I yeah. like the idea of it and <laughs> watching again the behind the scenes, the like the mechanics of it and getting that plane to take off. Uh -huh, and, yeah. You know, having the you know if you've got a train on a track and you've got to reset that that stunt, that's a very difficult thing to kind of pull mm -hmm. off. George Miller's wearing like an old timey kind of like hunters, you know, those like bell shaped hats uh -huh, on sure. set. He looks, okay. Yeah. Which is a lot of fun. It's good, but it exists in the in between state of like it's it's not as it's not as frenetic and like genuinely dangerous looking as the as the Road Warrior. Yeah. And it's not as kind of visual effects assisted chaos and with the years of of experience in directing of Yuri Road, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, okay, yeah. It's, some, it's, it's somewhere, it's somewhere else. Yeah, it's somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. So what's interesting is they got back Dennis Williams, the guy who rolled the Mack truck from the Road Warrior. Uh -huh. He was involved in a stunt where a train destroys a car or something like that. Which okay. Which happens... At least once in this whole scene. Sure, okay. I didn't. I wasn't glued to it. Honestly, right? I'm trying to think back to like what specific part he did, but I can't even think. Like I think about the Road Warrior, mm -hmm. and I can picture that entire sequence. Yeah, yeah. Where this, it's kind of this one is a little bit muddled, and it's even a little bit Looney Tunes in the sense that at one point, Angry Anderson's on the front of a train and it explodes. Oh yeah. And then he's just fine later. He's just a bit dusty. Some of his teeth have become piano keys. Yeah, yeah. You know, and he's got a big lump on his head that springs out. Do you think this is a nod to Slim Dusty, famous Australian country musician? Absolutely. Fantastic. Anyway, so after Dennis Miller performed a stunt, he sustained burns to his left arm and shoulder and was transported to a hospital via helicopter. So he, again, he came back for probably no money to perform a very dangerous stunt. <laughs> but he did it for the exposure. He did it for the and exposure. And we all know Dennis Miller. I fucking did this last week. His name is Dennis Williams. I'm a moron. Ah, you're cool. Ah, oh, thanks, man. Anyway, do you know what it's time for? What's it time for? Beyond Thun Trivia! It's, one, it's your worst one yet. They're supposed to be bad. Don't yeah, you realise that? No, but there's a fine line there, I think. Oh, okay. This was the your Beyond Thunderdome of <laughs> making a funny trivia name. Well, then next week is going to be incredible. Isn't it based by that logic? Probably. Anyway, Tina Turner had to shave her head for, uh, for the wig to fit perfectly, uh, which she did. She was cool with it, and that's great. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 400 really, if you're going to sign on for a, a Mad Max movie, you're going to have to expect they're going to do something dumb with your Get hair, Get ready right? for an atrocious haircut. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Think of the worst haircut you've ever seen on an Australian. 
it's going to be worse. <laughs> 400 pigs had to be used for the for the pig sequence. but And they were, they were numbered one to... Oh, here we go. Here's that um, joke. Here's that joke, joke everyone. They'd be numbered one to 401. Oh my god. And then you'd be like at the end of the at the end of the production schedule you'd yeah, be like where's where's, where's numbers where's four wait where's number 398 I can't find it. It yep. doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It's not there. They killed it. Though in using that many pigs the local council took them to court about being out the council's typical, right? <laughs> right. Uh, Bloody nanny state. Yeah, yeah. To stop them from doing so. So for them to be able to use that many pigs, it was under strict conditions. So everybody had to wear white protective gear when handling them and filming them and all of that. And everybody had to be disinfected coming in and out. It was very controlled and contained, which I feel like if they had 400 pigs in the first movie, they would have just shot them all at the end. Yeah. Just left them right there. <laughs> they would have left them out there to breed and we'd have <laughs> we'd have so many feral hogs in this oh country right now. More than we already have? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, This is fun. Do you like politics? This is fun. Uh, Angry Anderson's character Ironbar was named in mocking reference to Australian politician Wilson Ironbar Tucky. Tucky was convicted of assault after striking an Aboriginal man with a length of steel cable and fined $50. The man was allegedly being held down by Tucky's brother at the time. So that's where he got the name from. This famous politician did this thing and then became a politician. I think that's bad. I also think it's bad and I'm glad he's dead. He's probably dead. If you're you're alive, I I fucking hope you're not. (laughs) Kill yourself. Not wishing him dead. You sure? (laughs) Rest in piss, mate. (laughs) This is fun. This is a bit of a throwback. Okay. Now, they had to work with camels for this. Mm -hmm. Mad Max's, um, sorry, Matthew Max's, you know, it was was pulled along by camels. Everybody on set apparently hated the lead camel. He was a real prick. Uh, even for a camel, wow. just like really indignant. And his name, of course, was Rodney. Because it's, it's people will appreciate that and they'll, they'll write in the comments. And we'll, also, and we'll see it. Rodney! And we'll reply to every one of them. That's, that's correct. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yes. Anyways, the box office for this on a budget of $10 million, which I think was the most expensive Australian production of the time. It made $36 million. Okay, uh, that's not a bad return. No, it's all right. And again, it played for years. Uh, that's true. It's the one that you've probably seen on TV, uh, well, in Australia at least. And in terms of sequels, yes, we eventually got to Fury Road, which we'll talk about next week. But I want to talk about what they were sort of going to do instead of that. I will allow it. Okay, thank goodness. You're not going to take me to local council court and fight me on it? I mean, maybe later. (laughs) Okay, cool. Uh, So originally this was supposed to be the final in the trilogy. I mean, if they did more than, if they did another one. Doesn't make any sense. It wouldn't be a trilogy anymore, would it? The Indiana Jones trilogy. I don't even understand it anymore. Do you understand it? It's not even two trilogies. Right? It's a trilogy and then two other movies. Do another one so we can at least have the Indiana Jones two trilogies. (laughs) I can get the Indiana Jones two trilogies box set. That's right. One good trilogy and one really good trilogy. And you get to decide which is which. That's right. Yeah. George Miller initially planned to bring Mad Max to the small screen and he actually started developing a TV series in the 80s with John Blake to star. But John Blake's acting career was ended when he sustained permanent brain damage in an auto accident. Damn. So that was put on hold for a while. But then he revived the idea in the 90s. There was even a Variety article about it. And the idea was that this was going to be more low on violence, more adventure of the week, kind of a Xena warrior princess right, style okay. show where it was about not so much him like going out into the wasteland and like shooting a bunch of people uh-huh. with the one bullet that he has. <laughs> he was doing odd jobs for people to get parts for his car. Ah. And that was sort of worked into a comic, which explains why he has that car at the start of Fury Road for like a minute right. before he flips it like <laughs> immediately. Sure. So that's not the same car, but if there is any kind of continuity in this, it's because of that. But... If you actually want like a lead up into Fury Road outside of the comics, which is like the official thing, George Miller was actually developing a video game with Corey Balrog, who's been working on uh, of late the new God of War games. Oh, I mean, that's appropriate given his name is Balrog. Exactly. Is he related to the Balrog? Yeah, he's re- related to the Balrog. <laughs> From of, the Lord of the of Rings. Of Kaza Doom, yes, Mason, he is. Okay. Is that a stage name? No, I think that's his real name. And so they started developing this game together and with using all these concepts that they that they, they developed and, you know, things like the War Boys and, like, what the Wasteland will look like and different locations and aesthetics and different cars and all of that. And there's a lot of overlap in that and Fury Road. Right. But George Miller stepped away from that. Warner Brothers owned the concepts that they put together for that game and put it into the Mad Max video game from 2015 without George Miller's involvement. But that's also why it's so similar to Fury Road because it's sort of a prequel to Fury Road, but not really. 
Like anything in the Mad Max universe, it's not really connected to anything. Or it <laughs> sort of is. Which is very convenient. Mm. Star Wars should have done that. <laughs> yeah. They should have taken a page out of George Miller's book and been like, yeah, this next one? Yeah. Maybe related. You're talking about the good trilogy, the really good trilogy, or the best trilogy? All of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, this actually doesn't make sense. The lights have a different side. Yeah, it's, a, it's not really connected. <laughs> You're stupid for pointing that out, actually. <laughs> All right, anyways, if you want to come back next week, we are talking about Fury Road, aren't we? Yes. My goodness. Excited for that one? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good from memory. And I hope it is still very good. Me too. I hope I don't find any small flaws in it <laughs> upon a rewatch that ruin it for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm like, actually, Thunderdome is the best one. You're not going to say that. <gasps> but anyways, if you do want to say that early, you can actually head over to bigsandwich.co, where guess what? What? There's bonus podcasts up there. There's movie commentaries. We do video game Let's Plays. Expect to see some Mad Max content coming up oh, very soon. Oh, very good. Yeah. Not to spoil it, but there's three-ish Mad Max games, mm. and we're going to be looking at all of them. Great. Are some of them good? One of them is good. And we're playing several. There's three. Oh. And one of them's not really a Mad Max game. <laughs> okay, right. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about it. Again, that's over at bigsandwich.co where it's nine bucks a month. And it really helps out this channel. It helps us keep these sponsorship free. Not YouTube ad free. I'm running ads on this. Don't you worry about <laughs> that's that. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. That's between you and YouTube Premium, all yeah, right? Yeah, you figure that out. Or yeah. you do, use an ad block. I don't know what you're up to. Do whatever you want. That's That's fine. But I'm just telling you, bigsandwich.co is an option. That's right. To support us. Yeah, otherwise we have to we have to hawk, you know, protein supplements or whatever. <laughs> and nobody would believe that. Look at us. Yeah. We're so spindly. We're spindly. And sickly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm on TRT. But that I don't work out. It's just that. <laughs> I TRT and then I sleep. Okay, I just know. really absorb it. I don't know what that is, but it's Testosterone sounds... replacement therapy, sounds, Mason. Sounds dangerous. No, no, it's cool. Okay. And I look normal, actually. It's great. Some people think better than normal. A little bit That's better. That's great. Yeah, yeah. It's good for you, man. Yeah. Can you name a person who thinks that? Can I name so a person? Who thinks that? <laughs> no. Thing you said. I can name so many people. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Grab that jam, you guys. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. Mad Max. Mad Max.